What we'll do finally then is just run through a one-way ANOVA. So now we're getting on to uh, designs where we've got more than two groups. So we've still got one independent variable for this ANOVA, but we've got three groups. What I've got is some data here, which is similar to the data we had for the independent t-test. And what the experimenters did here is they wanted to look at three groups. So they wanted to look at the effects of getting full night sleep versus getting no sleep on exam score. But then they also included an extra group, group two here, where the participants in this group had partial sleep. So they were woken up in the middle of the night, so they didn't get a full night's sleep, but they did get more than the no sleep group. What we need to do then is a one-way ANOVA. So we'll conduct the overall ANOVA first, and then I'll go into some postdoc tests. So to run the ANOVA, you need to go to Analyze and Compare Means, and this time down to One-Way ANOVA. This will bring up this box. And what we want is for group to go into factor. This is the independent variable, for some reason called factor in SPSS. And exam score can go over to the dependence box. And we need to select some options in this one-way ANOVA. Otherwise, we won't get everything we really want. Uh, if you click on options, you can see this will bring up this box, and there's various options you can choose. We'll choose descriptive statistics because we want to look at the mean scores. The Levine's test, which is this homogeneity of variance test. And then we'll select these two as well, Brown, Forsyth, and Welch. These are statistics that you'd use if the Levine's test was significant. Like a t-test, you just use alternative statistics. We can click on continue and then click on the postdoc box. And this brings up the options for running postdoc tests. You can see that there are loads that you can choose from here. We'll just select Bonferroni for the moment, just to illustrate what post-hoc tests do and how to interpret them. But you might want to have a look in the Andy Field book about looking at which one of these tests you should use, both for, you've got two options, tests which assume equal variance, and again, if you've got a significant Levine's test, tests where the equal variance isn't assumed. And what we'll do now then is run that ANOVA, so click on OK. Then the first table we get in the output gives us the descriptive statistics. So again, we can use this just to check what's going on. We can see that the full sleep group we're now scoring at 62.2.30 on average, and partial sleep group was scoring slightly lower than this, and then the no sleep group was scoring lower than this at 52.46. What you can do then is take a look at the next table, and this is the Levine's test. So this time, again, we've got a non-significant Levine statistic, which means we can assume that the group variances are equal. And if they are equal, you can just go on to the next ANOVA table now. And this is the main ANOVA table, which gives you the test statistics for the overall ANOVA, assuming that we've got equal variances. Then what we want to extract from this is the F statistic and the p-value, first of all. The degrees of freedom in a one-way ANOVA, you want to report these two here. You want to report the between groups or the model degrees of freedom and the within groups or the error degrees of freedom. You can ignore the total degrees of freedom. You don't need to report that. So we report F with the degrees of freedom in brackets equals 5.94, and P is 0 0.005. And one thing we want now is a measure of effect size, which this time we're going to use eta squared. This is the most commonly used effect size measure for ANOVAs. You'll see this widely reported. So people know what this is, they're comfortable with it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best effect size for an ANOVA. And if you read the Andy Field book, he tends to favor population effect sizes, which give a better estimate of the probable or the likely effect size within the population, rather than just within this sample, which is what the eta squared looks at. 
But we'll stick with this one, because as I said, it's the most widely used effect size. And the eta squared is based on dividing the model sum of squares by the total sum of squares to give you a proportion. So it's always between 0 and 1. And it's quite a nice, handy, easily interpretable effect size, because it's the proportion of the variance in the exam scores for this example, which is accounted for by this model. In a one-way ANOVA, you can see eta squared is simply the between groups sums of squares, which is the same thing as the model sums of squares, and then divide that by total sums of squares, which gives you, so we'll run through the example here. We take this number here, sum of squares between groups, 830.207, divide that by the total, which is 3763.632, which gives you a eta squared of 0 0.22. What that means then is 22% of the variance in the exam score is accounted for by this model. In a one-way ANOVA, you do need to calculate this by hand, but you can see it's, fairly, it's very straightforward. In more complex ANOVAs, it's a little bit more fiddly because you're calculating eta squared and partial eta squared, but fortunately, SPSS does that for you when you go on to factorial ANOVAs. And then to report eta squared, you've got all of your other test statistics here, and then you just report the effect size at the end, so after the p-value. And then it helps to interpret the size of this as well. So to interpret the eta squared, you can just use these guidelines. Uh, eta squared of 0 0.01 would represent a small effect. That's representing the fact that only 1% of the variance in exam scores would be explained by the model. Uh, eta squared of 0 0.06 is a medium effect, and then anything around about or above 0.14 would be deemed a large effect. So for our example, the eta squared was 0.22, so that would be a large effect size. Again, these are general guidelines, but they're handy go-to guidelines for how to interpret this effect size. And just to point out, if the Levine's test was significant, so you've got unequal variances, this is why we selected this Welch and Brown Forsyth tests before. And you don't need to use both of these. You could use either one of these, but these statistics uh, used when you've got unequal variances, and it makes, like with the t-test, makes adjustments to the degrees of freedom, which will affect the statistics that you get out of this, and may affect whether your p-value is significant or not. So now we know we've got a significant overall ANOVA, we can go on to use post hoc tests. And we selected the Bonferroni test and you get this table up. So we'll just go through how to interpret this. The first comparison we're making will be between the full sleep group versus the partial sleep. So whenever you're doing post hoc comparisons, you're just comparing two groups. It's essentially the same as a t-test, but making adjustments to the critical value. So the first comparison was full sleep versus partial sleep. You just read along this line and get to this column here, which will give you the p-value. So we can see that the p-value for full sleep versus partial sleep was one, so this is not significant. The second comparison we want to make was full sleep versus no sleep, and you can use this row here. So this is comparing the first group full sleep with another group now no sleep. Read along the line, the p-value now is 0 0.007, so that was significant. The next row of data you'll see we've already looked at, because that's just comparing partial sleep with full sleep again. So this time we go to this row, and this is now comparing partial sleep with no sleep. Read along the line, and the p-value is 0 0.032, so that was also significant. So we've got two significant comparisons, one non-significant comparison. So then to report a one-way ANOVA, what you need to do is report the mean scores and standard deviations. You could either do this in a paragraph or in a table. 
if you've got more than three groups, say you're going on to four or five groups, it's sometimes better to just stick that information in a table somewhere. You want to report the statistics from the overall ANOVA. So this would be the F statistic, the uh, P value and the ETA squared, and then just indicate what the ETA squared means. Does it represent a small, medium or large effect? And then you can go on to report the post hoc tests. Quite often for a post hoc test, it will just be the p-values that are reported. As long as you've got the mean scores somewhere, then that's okay. You might also see mean differences reported for post hoc tests. That's optional, but you know if you wanted to stick that in, it's not the end of the world. And then you just, if you've got significant post hoc tests, just also interpret, again, the direction of the effect. So here, participants in the no sleep group performed significantly poorer on the test compared to both the partial sleep and the full sleep group. But there was no significant difference between the full sleep and partial sleep groups. 